welcome to the show. It is me, it is me, your girl, Labora Lee, aka Cat Lee, and we have now turned on to Ambitiously the Podcast. <coughs> yes, you have. Um, welcome, welcome, my ambitious ones, to another episode of Hood History. Hood History, if you don't know, is um, a segment of Ambitiously the Podcast where we break down certain things in history. Um, there's no chronological order. We just pick things in history that we want to talk about and we talk about it. And we don't go by the book. We never will. Sorry. Um, this episode of Hood History is called The Monumental City. Now, I told you before we were going to start with Baltimore and we'll branch out into other things, but I feel like my city has a very, um, well, one, my city is very historical, and two, the stories are something else, honey. So we are going to dive into this episode of Hood History with a city that most don't know about. It's called the Monumental City. We're going to talk about it. And the reason why it it resonates with me specifically is that it speaks on the African-American culture here in Baltimore and it speaks on slavery of, at the time. Um, so I'm going to take you back and we're going to talk about it. Let's get into it. The Monumental City. Okay. So the Monumental City. Not many know about the Monumental City. Most people who are from Baltimore, they know about Monument Street, but they don't know about the Monumental City. So we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to try to figure out why it was so monumental, but whatever. So the Monumental City, as it is known in the 1800s, specifically 1820s, um, was the headwaters, not headquarters, headwaters of American human trafficking. The, why, the reason why we say it's headwaters is because Baltimore is a port city. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like a lot of port in port goes on in this city, right? So, um, um, the traffic structural violence turned African American sons and daughters and wives and fathers into human products. Like we were on a fucking, excuse my language, but like we were on in the supermarket on the shelf. That's what we were at the time. Um, one of the seven, one in seven enslaved African Americans were forced across state lines in the following decade. Yeah, it happened. It happened. It happened to us. In Baltimore, black people were jailed, sold, shipped in merchant vessels. Most were stolen from families by slave traders. Um, but we're going to speak about this one particular dude because I think it's very it's, it's very important that we start with him. His name was Austin Woolfolk or Woolfolk, however you say it. Um, he was a mastermind of the market at the time. Mm -hmm. Just 19, he, when he arrived in Baltimore in 1815, the tall athletic slave trader operated out of the city's tavern handing banknotes to slaveholders thirsty I'm um, thirsty for liquid assets um wolf or folk <laughs> depending on how you want to say it came up in Tennessee served in the state's militia um beginning um during the war of 1812 I'm going to get to that war 1812 because I got a lot to say about that and participated in the Battle of New, or New Orleans. Um, there he saw the fortunes to be made on the backs of African American or African descendants. Um, descendant countrymen. The um, foreign slave trade was, was closed in 1808. Um, yet planters demanded um, young bound workers for their um, um, cane breakers and cotton fields. So I told y'all in the last episode, sugar cane was big here. It's huge here. Um, we are the hometown of Domino Sugar. Not many people know that. You buy Domino Sugar all the time when you go to the market. Well, <laughs> welcome to Baltimore. Um, as the, dem the demand rolls in the deep south for um, bond bonds persons, 
um, barn, barn away from eastern seaboard homes, slave prices in New Orleans reached roughly twice what they were in Maryland. Yet there wasn't yet an um an exchange. They weren't ready for that kind of life. So Wolf or Wolf Folk, however you say it, was an entrepreneur with a gift for imagining a market before it existed and then ushering in ushering in that making it so that it it was. Um, his main innovation was an advertising rapidly growing daily advertising and rapidly growing daily newspapers. Um, like, for example, we're gonna we're gonna get into it. Mm-hmm. We're gonna get into it. Um, cash for car or gold today. Cash for I hate this word, but cash for Negroes was his tagline. Um, he soon became a brand. Which is crazy that somebody could become a brand off of our backs, but it happened. It totally happened, and um, this is why we are the country we are today. This is what happened. So let's get back into the story because I told you I totally had a story to tell. So early he early on he used Baltimore City Jail, which is gone now. They just demolished it um, because of recent situations that happen um, to warehouse captives captives um, until shacking them together and force more um, force marching them to Georgia so Baltimore City Jail was where he held them and then he shackled them all together and he made them walk to Georgia um, but as soon as cotton became the nation's biggest ex- export uh, you know, one of the the biggest hot commodities of the time in the night the eighteen twenties, he built his own jail and booked space aboard merchant ships. He built a reputation in New Orleans, um, site of the Deep South's largest slave market. It's crazy, right? See how and you never know. Well, I, I'll tell you the story at the end of this, but. Um, So his brothers, he and his brothers and other relatives arrived in Maryland to cash in on the profits. Um, Him and allied traders set up purchasing agencies in Annapolis, Easton, and Washington, D.C. by 1821. Um, Wolfe's Baltimore headquarters included a whitewashed house, a private jail located on on West Pratt Street. I showed y'all that in the last episode, but on West Pratt Street at the intersection of what is known today, and I showed you that on the map. Maybe I'll pull it back up. But what is known today is Martin Luther King Boulevard. So Pratt Street and Martin Luther King Boulevard, you can go pull up a map and you'll see where it was. Um, That's where he housed his slaves. Um, This is where he jailed them. Um, And Um, any archaeological remains are buried underneath the divided highway um, because it is like it's a huge highway it's like one it's crazy Um, it was a far um, far far flung enterprise Uh, his his uncle John Wolfolk set up a New Orleans and um, Natchez running a sale agency selling people, acting like a bank, and remitting the tens of thousands of dollars, millions in today's money, um, that sustained a supply chain of captives. So basically, he was here, his uncle was in New Orleans, and it was a whole enterprise. Uh, The combination of newspaper advertising, um, financiering, and um, shipping as well as elaborate corporate form for today gave the family, it gave them something special, um, competitive advantages that drove rivals out of the market. So yeah, they was like, um, maybe I'm trying to think like what's a pop and okay, let's say they were like the Vanderbilts of their days, I guess. Um, so some protested cash for bloods green baltimore's niles weekly registered um register which is a newspaper 
um, in 1921. Anti anti slavery Quakers. Well, I'm gonna get to them too because we have a big Amish and then we have a big Quaker history as well. But um, anti slavery Qu Quakers arrived in Fells Point to 